Less is more. How degrowth will save the world, by Jason Hickel. We don't have a right to ask whether we're going to succeed or not. The only question we have a right to ask is, what's the right thing to do? What does this earth require of us if we want to continue to live on it? Wendell Berry. Preface. A vision informed by our shared vulnerability and by our solidarity. By Kofi Mawili Klu and Rupert Reed of XR. Extinction Rebellion XR is sometimes criticized for having demands that are too hard to achieve. But it's important to be clear about what XR is not. XR is not an all purpose way of fixing our adrift civilization. Rather, XR is the smoke alarm. XR is the non-violent cutting edge of what Jason Hickel calls, in this important new book, The Emergency Break. We want our governments to face up to the reality of the crisis at hand. But then, we have to figure out just how we change everything to create a better society that works for people and planet. XR is a recognition of emergency. We have learned a lot about emergencies over the past year with the rise of the coronavirus pandemic. The pandemic joined us in a mass of shared vulnerability and we had to move quickly and make difficult decisions in order to protect humanity, to protect life. The fact that most countries managed to do this is a fairly hopeful sign. It shows what we can achieve when we take a crisis seriously. Coronavirus is being taken pretty seriously precisely because of its having fallen most heavily first upon the global north. The wake up call it embodies needs so badly to be heard because the slower climate emergency is simultaneous with it and it poses a disproportionate threat to the global south where it is already inflicting mass suffering. So we are in a common crisis with differentiated effects. And we must be aware that some governments will respond with worsening environmental racism and hidden agendas of eco fascism. These are agendas to pit various groups against each other and also against diverse forms of life. They require solidarity in response. If the coronavirus is teaching us something about solidarity in action, then that is a real hope in this dangerous hour. Less is More offers incisive new ideas for what lies on the other side of the coronavirus emergency. Ideas for how we can prevent the ruin of our climate, roll back the ongoing sixth mass extinction, and avert societal collapse. It gives us a glimpse of how we can build something better out of the wreckage of what is. Jason Hickel offers a raft of intersecting, overlapping, and mutually reinforcing ideas from history, economics, anthropology, philosophy, science, and more. This is the kind of broad thinking that's required to achieve the rapid transition we need. The coronavirus crisis made it evident that if governments are determined enough and driven enough by circumstances and by the will of their peoples, then they can do things that they have been calling impossible for years. A citizen's income, debt cancellation, wealth taxes, nationalizations, where necessary, you name it. Jason sets out here how something similar, but even bigger, could characterize our way of exiting from the inanities and insanities of growthism. How we could build a better and more equal society which has far less impact upon our ecosystems and which makes people happier. There is a sense in which we really can have it all. At least, all that actually matters. A simpler way. This book offers hope by showing that the kind of demands that XR has put forward are achievable. They are possible. All it would take is enough vision of a restored earth a more regenerative culture, a better life together. The coronavirus crisis showed us all who the key workers are worldwide.
our medics, our food growers, our distributors, and so on. If we refocus society around need rather than artificially created wants, Jason sets out powerfully how distorted our lives are by advertising, reminding us that basically that is all that titans such as Facebook and Google are, we could recalibrate a world where together we could become more satisfied and less separated. We need to make this change. We all know this. We cannot wait. We have to change systems if we are to stop the growth juggernaut from barreling over us all. As XR's greatest supporter Greta Thunberg most memorably put it, speaking earlier this year to global elites, we are at the beginning of a mass extinction and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of endless economic growth. How dare you? We have to change systems not for any ideological reason, but simply because the emergency demands it. Much like food rationing during World War II in countries such as the UK, that was nothing to do with socialism and everything to do with survival. Yet it did make society more equal and did make people healthier. There is hope here again of achieving a beautiful coincidence. What we need to do to survive is the same as what we need to do to have better lives. In the early chapters of this book, Jason tells the terrifying history of capitalism. It's so grim that one might want to deny it, but it's true. And we need to face the truth, to face up to the reality underlying the climatic and ecological devastation we are enduring. When Jason tells us all the hard truth that GDP growth is an index of the welfare of capitalism, not of the welfare of humans, we need to listen. We cannot forget. The collapse is already happening. In the parts of the world that have done the least to cause it, where it's rarely picked up by the Western media, the movement evolved beyond our model of growth at all costs must be born in solidarity with the South. It must be about decolonization and about reparations, or it has missed the point. We in this society are inclined to always imagine more technological innovations as the way to solve our problems. But why are we not equally eager to imagine more social innovations too? It shows a great poverty of imagination to stop with capitalism, to assume that it is the only game in town. No. We are creative beings. We can imagine bigger than that. We can innovate in all sorts of ways. Less is more doesn't provide the answer, but it does clearly provide the possibility of an answer and the promise that there may be more if we are prepared to ask and to look and determined in fact to do so. More than anything, less is more provides a kind of proof that there is nothing unrealistic about what we are asking for. On the contrary, if one is really willing to face reality, there is nothing more unrealistic than the fantasy of continuing the status quo much longer. Jason doesn't spend much time in this book looking into the abyss of what if, in the end, we fail. XR is succeeding so far because an increasing number of people are finally willing to face their fears, their despair even, about the likelihood of collapse and to commit to doing something big about it. You can help that process. Join the growing direct honesty about the trajectory our societies are on, and then join the rebellion against the pseudo-destiny, our current path towards self-destruction. If one agrees with Jason's vision in this book, one has a profound responsibility to act accordingly. To achieve that vision and to avert the alternative, and that necessarily involves radical action to transform the status quo rapidly in ways that go beyond the capacity of normal politics. The post-corona moment may be humanity's last chance to learn from our shared vulnerability so as to create and realize a vision of a far more equal 
and far more sustainable world. Jason's book interprets the world quite brilliantly. Join us now in changing it. Rebels for life, rebelling for life. Rupert Reed and Kofi Mawuli Klu. England, April 2020. Introduction Welcome to the Anthropocene. My heart is moved by all I cannot save. So much has been destroyed. I have cast my lot with those who, age after age, perversely, with no extraordinary power, reconstitute the world. Adrian Rich Sometimes these realizations sneak up on you like a quiet memory, just the slightest hint that something isn't right. When I was growing up in Eswatini, the small country in southern Africa formerly known as Swaziland, my family had a rickety old Toyota pickup, the kind that was ubiquitous in the region in the 1980s. After long drives, it was my job to help clear the front grill of all the insects that accumulated there. Sometimes they were piled three deep, Butterflies, moths, wasps, grasshoppers, beetles of every conceivable size and colour, dozens if not hundreds of species. I remember my dad telling me that the insects on earth weighed more than all the other animals put together, including humans. I marvelled at this idea and found it somehow heartening. As a child, I worried about the fate of the living world, as I think many children do. So this story about the insect made me feel that everything was going to be okay. It was comforting to be reminded of the seemingly inexhaustible abundance of life. This fact would drift to mind on hot nights while we sat outside on the porch, hoping for a breeze, watching moths and beetles swarm around the light, dodging the bats that would sometimes swoop through to snatch a meal. I became fascinated with insects. At one point, I tried to identify all the different species around our home, running about with pen and little notebook in hand. In the end, I had to give up. There were too many to count. My dad still shares that old story about the insect from time to time, always in an excited tone in the way that dads do, like it's a new fact he's just discovered. But these days, it doesn't quite ring true. Things feel different somehow. When I've returned to Southern Africa for research in recent years, the car turns out more or less clean even after the long journeys. Maybe a few flies here and there, but nothing at all like before. Perhaps it's just that the insects loom large in my childhood memories. Or perhaps there's something more troubling afoot. In late 2017, a team of scientists reported some strange and rather alarming findings. They had been meticulously counting insect numbers in German nature reserves for decades. This is something that very few scientists had taken the time to do. The sheer abundance of insects makes such an exercise seem unnecessary, so everyone was curious to see what would come of it. The results were devastating. The team found that three-quarters of flying insects in Germany's nature reserves had vanished over the course of 25 years, due, they concluded, to the conversion of surrounding forests to farmland, followed by the intensive use of agricultural chemicals. The study went viral, capturing headlines around the world. We appear to be making vast tracts of land inhospitable to most forms of life and are currently on course for ecological Armageddon, one of the scientists said. If we lose the insects, then everything is going to collapse. Insects are essential to pollination and plant reproduction and as a food source for thousands of other species. As insignificant as they may seem, they are key nodes in the web of life. As if to confirm these fears, a few months later, two studies reported that falling insect populations had caused a dramatic decline of birds on farmland in France. Average numbers had fallen by a third in only 15 years, with some species, like meadow pipits and partridges, collapsing by as much as 80%. In the same year, news out of China reported that insect die-offs had triggered a pollination crisis. Absurd photographs emerged of workers going from plant to plant, pollinating crops by hand. 
the problem isn't unique to these regions. Insect decline appears to be happening everywhere. A global review of evidence published in 2019 found that at least 10% of insect species are at risk of extinction, and probably more. It's even happening in some of the most remotest parts of the world. In 2018, a team of scientists published a study of insects in the El Yunque rainforest in Puerto Rico, a protected zone far away from highways, farms, and factories, about as wild as you can hope to get. And yet, Even in the heart of the jungle, they found that insect biomass had declined by up to 98% over a 36 year period, almost total population collapse. We couldn't believe the first results, one of them reported to The Economist. I remember in the 1970s, butterflies were everywhere after the rain. On the first day back in 2012, I saw hardly any. Worse still, the collapse in insect numbers had in turn triggered the decline of a wide range of species that rely on insects for food, everything from lizards to birds. The whole system seemed to be unraveling. What could cause such calamity to strike in the middle of a jungle? In this case, scientists pinned it on climate change. Rainforests in Puerto Rico have warmed by about 2 degrees centigrade over pre industrial levels, twice as much as the world average. 2 degrees is enough to push many tropical insects beyond their thermal limits. The American entomologist David Wagner said that the study was one of the most disturbing he had ever seen. Disturbing because what's happening in Puerto Rico's rainforests gives us a glimpse of what might happen in the rest of the world as global warming accelerates. Average global temperatures are up by 1 degree Celsius so far. As we begin to approach 2 degrees Celsius, insect populations could start collapsing everywhere. Those dying butterflies in the El Yunque forest are the canaries in the coal mine. This is not a book about doom. It is a book about hope. It's about how we can shift from an economy that's organized around domination and extraction to one that's rooted in reciprocity with the living world. But before we begin that journey, it's important that we grasp what's at stake. The ecological crisis happening around us is much more serious than we generally assume. It's not just one or two discrete issues, something that could be solved with a targeted intervention here and there while everything else carries on as normal. What's happening is the breakdown of multiple interconnected systems, systems on which human beings are fundamentally dependent. If you're already familiar with what's going on, you may want to skim over this part. If not, brace yourself. It's not just the insects. Living in an age of mass extinction. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Transfer land to big companies. Rip up any hedges and trees and plant it all with a single crop. Spray it from aeroplanes and harvest with giant combines. Beginning in the middle of the 20th century, whole landscapes were remade according to the totalitarian logic of industrial profit, most of it for livestock feed, with the goal of maximizing extraction. They called it the Green Revolution, but from the perspective of ecology, there was nothing green about it. By reducing complex ecological systems to a single dimension, everything else became invisible. Nobody noticed what was happening to the insects and the birds, or even to the soil itself. If you've ever picked up a handful of rich, dark, fragrant soil, you'll know that it's crawling with life. Worms, grubs, insects, fungus, and millions of microorganisms. That life is what makes soils resilient and fertile. But over the past half century, industrial agriculture, with its reliance on aggressive plowing and chemical inputs, has been killing soil ecosystems at a rapid clip. UN scientists have found that 40% of the planet's soils are now seriously degraded. Agricultural soil is being lost more than a hundred times faster than it's being formed. In 2018, a scientist from Japan made the effort to sort through evidence on earthworm populations from around the world. 
he found that on industrial farms, earthworm biomass had plunged by a dramatic 83%. And as the earthworms died off, the organic content of soils collapsed by more than half. Our soils are being turned into lifeless dirt. The consequences are worrying, to say the least. Crop yields are now declining on a fifth of the world's farmland. If this continues, scientists warn, the earth will be able to support only another 60 years of harvest. The very soils that have formed the foundations of human civilization for tens of thousands of years are suddenly, in a matter of decades, on the verge of collapse. Something similar is happening in our oceans. When we go to the supermarket, we take for granted that we'll find all the seafood we love. Cod, hake, haddock, salmon, tuna, species that are central to human diets all around the world. But this easy certainty is beginning to crumble. Recent figures show that around 85% of global fish stocks are now depleted or facing collapse. Haddock have fallen to 1% of their former volume. Halibut, those magnificent giants of the sea, to one-fifth of 1%. Fish catches are beginning to decline around the world for the first time in recorded history. In the Asia-Pacific, fishery yields are on track to hit zero by 2048. Most of this is due to aggressive overfishing. Just as with agriculture, corporations have turned fishing into an act of warfare, using industrial megatrawlers to scrape the seafloor in their hunt for increasingly scarce fish, hauling up hundreds of species in order to catch the few that have market value, turning coral gardens and colourful ecosystems into lifeless plains in the process. Whole ocean landscapes have been decimated in the scramble for profit. But there are also other forces at work. Farming chemicals like nitrogen and phosphorus are flowing into rivers and ending up in the sea, creating giant algae blooms that cut off oxygen to the ecosystems that lie beneath them. Vast dead zones sprawl along the coastlines of industrialized regions like Europe and the United States. Once churning with life, many of our seas are becoming eerily empty, populated more by plastic than by fish. Oceans are also being affected by climate change. More than 90% of the heat from global warming gets absorbed into the sea. As oceans heat up, nutrient cycles are being disrupted, food chains broken, and vast stretches of marine habitat are dying off. At the same time, industrial emissions are causing oceans to become more acidic. This is a problem, because ocean acidification has driven mass extinction events a number of times in the past. It played a major role in the last extinction event, 66 million years ago, when ocean pH dropped by 0.25. That small shift was enough to wipe out 75% of marine species. On our present emissions trajectory, ocean pH will drop by 0.4 by the end of the century. We know what's about to happen. We can see it coming. In fact, it's already beginning to play out in real time. Marine animals are disappearing at twice the rate the land animals are. Vast coral ecosystems are being bleached into dead, colorless skeletons. Divers have reported that even remote reefs once teeming with life are now plagued by the stench of decomposing flesh. What begins as a vague inkling about moths and beetles, the flickers of a childhood memory, turns into a crippling realization, like a blow to the gut. We are sleepwalking into a mass extinction event, the sixth in our planet's history, and the first to be caused by human economic activity. The rate of extinction is now 1,000 times faster than before the Industrial Revolution. A few years ago, virtually no one was talking about this. Like my dad with his insect stories, everyone just assumed that the web of life would always be intact. Now the situation is so severe that the United Nations has set up a special task force to monitor it. The Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, IPBES. In 2019, it published its first comprehensive report. 
a groundbreaking assessment of the planet's living species, drawing on 15,000 studies from around the world and representing the consensus of hundreds of scientists. Since 1970, it found, the number of birds, mammals, reptiles and amphibians has dropped by more than half. A quarter of all species are at risk of extinction. I keep staring at these numbers, but I can't get them to make any sense. It all feels so surreal, like a fever dream where the world seems strange, unfamiliar and out of proportion. Robert Watson, the chair of the IPBES, called the UN report ominous. The health of ecosystems on which we and all other species depend is deteriorating more rapidly than ever, he said. We are eroding the very foundations of our economies, livelihoods, food security, health and quality of life worldwide. Scientists are not known for using strong language. They prefer to write in a neutral, objective tone. But reading through these reports, one can't help noticing that many of them have felt compelled to shift registers. A recent study published in the prestigious Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, a serious, stuffy journal, described the extinction crisis as biological annihilation and concluded that it represents a frightening assault on the foundations of human civilization. Humanity will eventually pay a very high price, the authors wrote, for the decimation of the only assemblage of life that we know of in the universe. This is the thing about ecology. Everything is interconnected. It's difficult for us to grasp how this works because we're used to thinking of the world in terms of individual parts rather than complex wholes. In fact, that's even how we've been taught to think of ourselves, as individuals. We've forgotten how to pay attention to the relationships between things. Insects necessary for pollination, birds that control crop pests, grubs and worms essential to soil fertility, mangroves that purify water, the corals on which fish populations depend. These living systems are not out there, disconnected from humanity. On the contrary, our fates are intertwined. They are, in a real sense, us. It's impossible to adequately understand our ecological crisis with the same reductive thinking that caused it in the first place. This is particularly clear when it comes to climate change. We tend to think about climate change as primarily a matter of temperature. Many people are not particularly concerned about this because our everyday experience with temperature is that a few degrees doesn't really make that much of a difference. But temperature is just the beginning. It's the loose thread on the sweater. Some of the consequences of temperature rise are obvious, since we can see and experience them directly. The number of extreme storms that happen each year has doubled since the 1980s. They now hit so frequently that even extraordinary spectacles blur together in our memories. If you remember, 2017 alone clobbered the Americas with some of the most destructive hurricanes on record. Harvey laid waste to huge swathes of Texas. Irma left Barbuda virtually uninhabitable. Mariah plunged Puerto Rico into months of darkness and wiped out 80% of the island's crops. These were Category 5 hurricanes, the most severe type. Storms like this should happen only once in a generation. But in 2017, they rolled in one after another, leaving mayhem and destruction in their wake. Rising temperatures have also triggered deadly heat waves. The heat wave that struck Europe in 2003 killed a staggering 70,000 people in just a few days. France was hit hardest, with temperatures soaring over 40 degrees for more than a week. Wheat crops collapsed by 10% as drought ravaged the continent. Moldova saw its whole harvest decimated. Three years later, it happened again, breaking temperature records across northern Europe. In 2015, Heat waves in India and Pakistan sustained temperatures over 45 degrees Celsius and killed more than 5,000 people. In 2017, a heat wave across Portugal triggered wildfires that ripped through the country's forests. 
Roads became graveyards as people roasted to death in their cars while trying to flee. Smoke blackened the skies as far away as London. In 2020, bushfires in Australia forced people to take refuge on beaches in scenes reminiscent of an apocalyptic film. As many as one billion wild animals were killed. Horrific images emerged of landscapes strewn with charred kangaroos and koalas. Events like these feel real and tangible. They become media headlines. But the more dangerous aspects of climate change do not. At least, not yet. So far, we've only barely breached one degree Celsius over pre-industrial levels. On our current trajectory, we are on track to reach a rise of up to four degrees Celsius by the end of the century. If we factor in countries' pledges to cut emissions under the Paris Agreement, which are voluntary and non-binding, global temperatures will still rise by as much as 3.3 degrees Celsius. These are not incremental changes. Humans have never lived on such a planet. That deadly heat wave that struck Europe in 2003? That will be a normal summer. Spain, Italy and Greece will turn into deserts with climates more like the Sahara than the Mediterranean as we know it. The Middle East will be cast into permanent drought. At the same time, rising seas will change our world almost beyond recognition. So far, sea levels are up about 20 centimetres since 1900. Even this apparently small rise has made flooding more frequent and storm surges more dangerous. When Hurricane Michael smashed into the United States in 2018, it brought a 14-foot surge that turned parts of the Florida coastline into a hellscape of shattered houses and twisted metal. If we carry on with business as usual, all of this will get much worse. In fact, even if we meet the Paris goal of keeping temperature rises to no more than 2 degrees Celsius, sea levels are projected to go up another 30 to 90 centimetres by the end of the century. Given the damage that 20 centimetres has caused, it's difficult to imagine what things will be like when it's up to four times higher than it is right now. The storm surges alone will be catastrophic. The wall of waves unleashed by Hurricane Michael will seem quaint by comparison. And if temperatures rise by 3 degrees Celsius or 4 degrees Celsius, sea levels will go up by as much as 100 centimetres and possibly 200 centimetres. Virtually all of the planet's beaches will be underwater. Much of Bangladesh, home to 164 million people, will disappear. Cities like New York and Amsterdam will be permanently flooded, as will Jakarta, Miami, Rio and Osaka. Countless people will be forced to flee coastal regions. All this century. And yet, as disastrous as all of this will be, perhaps the most concerning impact of climate change has to do with something much more quotidian. Food. Half of Asia's population depends on water that flows from the Himalayan glaciers, not only for drinking and other household needs, but also for agriculture. For thousands of years, the runoff from those glaciers has been replenished each year by new ice. But now the ice is melting faster than it's being replaced. If we hit 3 degrees Celsius or 4 degrees Celsius of warming, most of those glaciers will be gone before the end of the century, ripping the heart out of the region's food system and leaving 800 million people in trouble. In southern Europe, Iraq, Syria and much of the rest of the Middle East, extreme droughts and desertification will render whole regions inhospitable to agriculture. Major food-growing regions in the US and China will also take a hit. According to NASA, droughts in the American plains and in the southwest could turn these regions into dust bowls. As a handy rule of thumb, scientists say that for every degree we heat the planet, the yields of staple cereal crops will decline by 10%. On our present trajectory, that means losses of up to 30% this century. In some cases, it will be worse. Indian wheat and U.S. corn could plummet by as much as 60%. Under normal circumstances, regional food shortages can be covered by surpluses from elsewhere on the planet. But climate breakdown could trigger shortages on multiple continents at once. 
According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, warming more than two degrees is likely to cause sustained food supply disruptions globally. As one of the lead authors of the report put it, the potential risk of multi breadbasket failure is increasing. Add this to soil depletion, pollinator die-off and fishery collapse, and we're looking at spiraling food emergencies. This will have serious implications for global political stability. Regions affected by food shortages will see mass displacement as people migrate in search of stable food supplies. In fact, it's happening already. Many of those fleeing places like Guatemala and Somalia are doing so because their farms are no longer viable. The international system is already straining, with 65 million people displaced from their homes by wars and droughts, more than at any time since the Second World War. As migration pressures build, politics are becoming more polarized, fascist movements are on the march, and international alliances are beginning to fray. Factor in escalating displacement due to famines, storms and rising seas, plus dwindling arable farmland, and there's no predicting what conflagrations might occur. Ecosystems are complex networks. They can be remarkably resilient under stress, but when certain key nodes begin to fail, knock-on effects reverberate through the web of life. This is how mass extinction events unfolded in the past. It's not the external shock that does it, the meteor or the volcano. It's the cascade of internal failures that follows. It can be difficult to predict how this kind of thing plays out. Things like tipping points and feedback loops make everything much riskier than it otherwise might be. This is what makes climate breakdown so concerning. Take the polar ice caps, for example. Ice functions like a giant reflector, bouncing light from the sun back out into space. This is known as the albedo effect. But as ice sheets disappear and reveal the darker landscapes and oceans beneath, all that solar energy gets absorbed and radiated as heat into the atmosphere. This drives yet further warming, which causes the ice to melt even faster, completely irrespective of human emissions. In the 1980s, Arctic sea ice covered an average of about 7 million square kilometers. As I write this, it's down to about 4 million. Feedback loops affect forests, too. As the planet heats up, forests become drier and more vulnerable to fire. When forests burn, they release carbon into the atmosphere, and we lose them as a sink for future emissions. This exacerbates global warming, but it also has a direct impact on rainfall. Forests literally produce rain. The Amazon, for instance, exhales some 20 billion tons of water vapor into the atmosphere every day, like an enormous river flowing invisibly into the sky. Much of it ends up raining back down onto the forest, but it also produces rain much further afield, across South America and even as far north as Canada. Forests are critical to our planet's circulatory system. They're like giant hearts that pump life-giving water around the world. As forests die off, droughts become more common, and forests in turn become yet more vulnerable to fire. The speed at which this is happening is frightening. On our current trajectory, most rainforests will wither away into savannah before the end of this century. In some cases, tipping points work so rapidly that whole systems can collapse in a very short period of time. Scientists worry in particular about a phenomenon known as marine ice cliff instability. In the past, most climate models have assumed that even if global warming locks in the total melting of the West Antarctic ice sheet, the process of disintegration will stretch out over a couple of centuries. But in 2016, two American scientists, Rob DeConto and David Pollard, published an article in the journal Nature pointing out that it may well happen a lot faster. Ice sheets are thicker in the middle than they are around the edges, so as icebergs break off, they expose taller and taller ice cliffs. This is a problem because taller ice cliffs can't support their own weight. Once they're exposed, they begin to buckle, one after the other, in a domino effect, like skyscrapers collapsing. 
This could cause ice sheets to disintegrate not in centuries, but decades, perhaps as little as 20 to 50 years. If this plays out, the West Antarctic ice sheet alone could add another metre or more to sea level rise in our lifetime. If the same thing happens to Greenland, it could be worse still. The world's coastal cities would be submerged so fast there would be little time for adaptation. Kolkata, Shanghai, Mumbai and London all would be swamped, along with much of the world's economic infrastructure. It would be a catastrophe of almost unimaginable scale. And we know this can happen because it's happened before. It happened at the end of the last ice age, in fact. Scientists who study ice cliff dynamics have been loudly critical of governments for not accounting for this risk in their climate models. All of this complexity opens up real questions about our ability to control global temperatures. Some scientists worry we may not be able to park temperature increases at 2 degrees, as the Paris Agreement assumes. If we heat to 2 degrees, we might trigger cascades that could spiral out of control and push the Earth into a permanent hothouse state. Temperatures could soar far above the target threshold, and we would be utterly powerless to stop it. In light of these risks, the only rational response is to do everything possible to keep warming to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. And that means cutting global emissions to zero much, much faster than anyone is presently planning. Behind the Eco Fact This isn't the first time you've heard all of this, of course. If you're reading this book, it's probably because you're already concerned. You've already read dozens of stomach-churning facts about the crisis we're in. You know something is terribly wrong. I don't need to convince you. That's not what this book is for. The philosopher Timothy Morton has likened our obsession with eco-facts to the nightmares suffered by people with post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. In PTSD dreams, you relive your trauma and wake up viscerally terrified, sweating and shaking. For some reason, the nightmares happen over and over again. Sigmund Freud argued that this is your mind's attempt to ameliorate your fear by trying to insert you into the moments right before the trauma happened. The idea is that if you're able to anticipate the traumatic event, you might be able to avoid it, or at least prepare yourself psychologically. Morton thinks our eco-facts serve a similar function. By endlessly repeating terrifying eco-facts, on some subconscious level we're trying to insert ourselves into a fictional moment right before collapse happens, so we can see it coming and do something about it. Or at least we'll feel prepared when it arrives. In this sense, eco-facts carry a double message. On the one hand, they cry out, urging us to wake up and act right now. But at the same time, they imply that the trauma is not yet fully here, that there's still time to avert disaster. This is what makes them so beguiling, so reassuring, and why we seem strangely to crave more of them. The danger of this is that we will all be lulled into waiting around for the facts to become more extreme. Once we reach that point, we tell ourselves, we'll finally get around to doing something about it. But the ultimate eco-fact is never going to arrive. It's never going to be good enough. Just as in the PTSD dream, eco-facts never work as they're supposed to. They always fail, and in the end we wake up crying in the middle of the night, shivering with unspeakable fear, because on some deep level we know that the trauma has already arrived. We're already in the middle of it. We are living in a world that is dying. The facts have been piling up for decades. They become more elaborate and more concerning with each passing year. And yet, for some reason, we've been unable to change course. The past half-century is littered with milestones of inaction. A scientific consensus on anthropogenic climate change first began to form in the mid-1970s. The first international climate summit was held in 1979, three years before I was born. The NASA climate scientist James Hansen gave his landmark testimony to the U.S. Congress in 1988, explaining how the combustion of fossil fuels was driving climate breakdown. 
The UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, was adopted in 1992 to set non binding limits on greenhouse gas emissions. International climate summits, the UN Congress of Parties, have been held annually since 1995 to negotiate plans for emissions reductions. The UN framework has been extended three times, 